You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about the breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan violates ceasefire at LOC. USA's level of violence in Afghanistan not conducive for peace process. And experts suggest Hafiz Said's arrest more of a sham than real counter-terror financing action. This week, Pakistan once again resorted to cross-border firing at LOC. Islamabad's consistent efforts to wreak havoc in Jammu and Kashmir through mortar shelling and attempts of infiltration is making life difficult for the residents of the border area, who are the direct victims of Pakistan's targeted violence in the valley, a report. The Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir continues to remain tense as Indo-Pak line of control is constantly being targeted by Pakistan army. Continuing with its malicious agenda, Pakistan recently launched unprovoked rounds of ceasefire violations by firing artillery guns and intense shelling with mortars along the LOC in Rampur and Uri sector of Jammu and Kashmir. According to residents, the firing began at around 10.45 a.m. local time. Indian troops retaliated and are giving a befitting reply to each and every firing from Pakistan's side. बहुत हैवी फायरिंग पाकिस्तान की तरफ से इधर हो रही है जर्द के पास हो रही है हमारा इधर दरगाह तो इधर जर्द के पास जो मतलब लग रहा है गोला पाकिस्तान से लग रहा है तो ये हिंदुस्तानी आर्मी ने जवाब दे रही है लेकिन हम पाकिस्तान खामोश नहीं हो रहा है चुप नहीं हो रहा है Pakistan that claims to be a peace loving state has not stopped shelling at the LOC for even one single day after the Pulwama attack it has violated the ceasefire agreement at the borders for more than 60 times by targeting forward posts and villages along the line of control in Akhnur, Punj and Rajori sector of Jammu and Kashmir. This time again, Pakistan has initiated unprovoked ceasefire violations by small arms firing and shelling with mortars along LOC in Dekhwar sector of Punj. Pakistan is trying to do huge amount of infiltration in Jammu and Kashmir. And every time when they make an attempt to infiltrate, we are absolutely mowing, mowing the infiltrated down. But now what they've started, they've started using the civilians of POK as cannon fodder, as a dhal, as a shield. Behind that shield are the infiltrators. So that initially when we open fire, it is the civilians who get killed and the Pakistani infiltrators then turn back and run away. So this is cowardice of the ultimate variety. Using civilians as a shield or cannon forward is something that a military never does. It's only a coward who does and Pakistan is displaying down, downright cowardice. Also, 84 soldiers of Indian security forces lost their lives in terrorist attacks and in fighting the terrorists who infiltrated into Indian territories from the LOC. 40 Indian CRPF soldiers had lost their lives in the deadly Pulwama attack of 2019. While terrorists are trying their best to target civilians and Indian security forces personnel, the Indian Army remains consistent in their mission of complete eradication of terrorism from the valley. In 2019 and 2020, 202 terrorists were neutralized by the Indian security forces in different counter-terrorism operations. Despite repeated calls made during Indo-Pak flag meetings to maintain restraint and adherence to the ceasefire understanding, Pakistan has been increasingly violating the 2003 ceasefire agreement with India. Past few years have witnessed the highest number of ceasefire violations by Pakistan troops in the last 15 years. And the Pulwama bombing of 2019 showed that Pakistan is far from maintaining any restraint from its side and will continue to hamper peace in India even after receiving global condemnation from across the world. The air of deep uncertainty that has for so long dominated Afghanistan appear even larger as the country is witnessing constant attacks ever since the signing of the historic peace deal 
between the United States and the Taliban. However, the United States warned Taliban that the current high level of violence can put the peace deal in jeopardy, a report. After more than a year of negotiations, the U.S. government and the Taliban signed a peace agreement on February 2019, 2020 that calls for the full withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan within 14 months. In return, Taliban pledged to prevent Afghanistan's territory under their control from being used by terrorist forces. But constant wave of attacks in Afghanistan has once again raised the concerns about country's future. The United States warned the Taliban that the current high level of violence by the insurgents was not conducive to advancing the peace process as the United Nations Security Council backed a US-led push to end Afghanistan's 18-year war. The United States signed an agreement with the Taliban last month. It calls for a phased withdrawal of US-led foreign forces if the Taliban keeps its commitments and for the start of talks between the insurgents and Afghan government delegation on a political settlement to end decades of conflict. We were pleased to introduce this resolution endorsing the U.S.-Taliban agreement and the U.S.-Afghanistan joint declaration, and we appreciate the Security Council's support for this resolution and the constructive engagement of all of our colleagues during the negotiations. The support and engagement of the international community will continue to be critical in the next steps of the peace process. We are especially grateful to His Highness Sheikh Tamim for Qatar's support and the critical role it played in hosting the talks that led to this momentous occasion. We are eagerly looking forward to the next steps of the peace process, though unfortunately the presidential electoral process and the unacceptably high levels of violence by the Taliban in Afghanistan have not permitted intra-Afghan negotiations to start on time. Prioritizing an inclusive government and unified Afghanistan is paramount for the future of the country and especially for the cause of peace. Deputy U.S. Ambassador to the UN, Cherith Norman Shale says that more needs to be done and we urge Taliban to also reduce violence against Afghan forces in the countryside to give intra-Afghan negotiations and peace the opportunity to succeed. We acknowledge the Taliban have taken steps to stop attacks in cities and against major bases. But more needs to be done and we urge them to also reduce violence against Afghan forces in the countryside to give intra-Afghan negotiations and peace the opportunity to succeed. Violence at these levels risks drawing both sides into a vicious cycle, serves no one, and undermines peace. The UN resolution welcomed the significant steps towards ending the war and opening the door to intra-Afghan negotiations enabled by separate U.S. agreements with the Taliban and the Afghan government. The Council also expressed a readiness upon the commencement of the intra-Afghan negotiations to consider the start of the review of the status of Taliban sanctions. For this process now to start, we call for a speedy um, start of the intra-Afghan negotiations and we welcome the announcement of the negotiating team by the government of Afghanistan today and hope that outstanding issues on the prisoners exchange can be resolved without delay. With regard to the negotiating teams, um, and I expressly say both negotiating teams, it is key that what we always preach here in general happens in practice, that women are part of the negotiations um, and not only uh, marginal part but substantive part of the of the teams of the negotiation compounding the challenges faced by Afghanistan an escalating political feud is also threatening political chaos the Security Council resolution also emphasized the importance of including women youth and minorities and ensuring any political settlement protects their rights
Hafiz Saeed, Supreme Powers in Islamabad's affairs, exposes Pakistan's dubious techniques of treating terror leaders who although have been lodged behind bars but are exercising complete control over all the state machineries, including the judiciary. If latest media reports are to be believed, Lashkar and JUD leader Saeed is expected to get freed from his conviction soon as his lawyer is set to file an appeal based on a 2009 case, a report. An anti-terrorism court indicted jamaat dawa chief Hafiz Saeed on terror financing charges last year in Lahore. The move came after immense global pressure on the country to bring terror leaders residing in the country to justice. The timing of the filing of the cases and Saeed's arrest in July 2019 was related to two events. The first was Prime Minister Imran Khan's visit to the US in July 2019 where he was to meet President Donald Trump. The second was pressure from the Paris-based International Terror Financing Watchdog, the Financial Action Task Force. Recent advancements in Saeed's case suggest that his conviction is likely to be struck down on appeal on the ground that in 2009, a full bench of the Lahore High Court had declared that he was not a member of the banned L.E.T. According to Saeed's lawyer, he had left the L.E.T. on December 24, 2001, while the organization was banned on January 14, 2002. Experts from India, however, suggest that whether the action against Saeed is indicative of a new direction in Pakistan's counter-terrorism policy or merely a tactical ploy as before to escape economic sanctions remains to be seen in near future. This time also the court has convicted him along with four of his uh, associates but ultimately when it comes to uh, giving him the punishment they will save him somehow. They have done it in the past, they are doing it now and they might do it in the future also. This entire eyewash has been done on the pressure of the US and the other international agencies. Even the now US diplomat has said that do you have to take action, you have to convict him. But when it comes to actually conviction, he is again bailed out. Then he is put in house arrest. These are all the eyewash things which Pakistan tries to fool the world by getting the sanctions removed, getting out of the FATF sanctions and protecting their basic uh, ISI agenda. Under pressure from the international community, the Pakistani authorities launched investigations into matters of the Lashkar-e Taiba, jamaat -e dawa and its charity wing, Falai Insaniyat Foundation, for their holding and use of trusts to raise funds for terrorism financing. At least 56 seminaries and facilities being run by the JUD and FIF in southern Sindh province were also taken over by authorities in the same case. Consequently, Hafiz Said, the co-founder and the chief of these terrorist groups, was arrested in connection with charges relating to terror financing and has been detained at Court Lakhpat Jail since then. On Pakistan's support to terrorism experts from European Foundation for South Asian Studies suggest, in spite of these so-called measures by Pakistan's counter-terrorism department, there seems to be absolutely no curb being put on terror financing and terror activities taking place in the country and hence the country still remains a dangerous place to reside in. Pakistan still remains on the grey list, therefore it has not apparently fulfilled the necessary conditions and quotas to be considered a, a safe zone and safe, uh, to have provided safety for its uh, citizens. The Asia-Pacific group of FATF has already blacklisted Pakistan for unsatisfactory measures to curb terrorism operating on its soil. Besides, Global Terror Financing Watchdog FATF in February retained Pakistan on its grey list till its next plenary session scheduled to be held in June. The retaining of Pakistan on grey list is a consequence of its failure in taking adequate action against money laundering and terror financing. 
Pakistan on ground has done nothing to stop this flow of funds through the terror uh, terrorism to terror agencies to the terrorists who are residing and enjoying a good life in Pakistan. It only future we'll see if the pressure is built up on Pakistan internationally and he's moved to the blacklist then it will have a serious implication on Pakistan because Pakistan today is surviving on foreign funding only. If the funding stops, Pakistan has no option other than to stop the funding of these terror activities, um, activities. But as on today, Pakistan has done nothing and the grey list continues. They are uh, reviews again and again and Pakistan is requesting reviews based on the some false evidences which he is getting time so far but I don't think in the long run they will be able to escape these sanctions. As long as Pakistan doesn't take significant steps to fight terrorism and proves that it is genuinely severing ties with Islamist militants, there are high chances of it getting blacklisted by the global body. If blacklisted by the FATF, Pakistan can face financial consequences and economic setbacks at a time when its economy is already in crisis. Also, it will get difficult for the country to get any financial aid from International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and other international organizations, making its financial condition more precarious. South Asia is one of the most concentrated regions in terms of terror presence, which makes it susceptible to the continued attacks planned and launched by Islamic radicals. The region suffered huge economic and human losses to terrorism in 2019. From Pulwama attacks to deadly Easter Sunday bombings, terrorism claimed scores of lives in the subcontinent. Unabated park-backed spree of violence killed hundreds in Afghanistan in spite of repeated warnings by international organizations, including the FATF, Islamabad has been brazenly nurturing, training and launching more and more terrorists to unleash bloodshed in the region. Today, we focus on this never-ending park-sponsored story of violence, a report. South Asia has long been facing the wrath of Islamist terrorism. According to a partial data compiled by an online terrorism portal since 2005, the region has accounted for at least 71,400 Islamist terrorism-linked fatalities. Year 2019 saw three deadliest attacks in South Asia, which together claimed 391 lives. South Asia has been facing a lot of uh, militant attacks, mainly sponsored by the ISI. And I, Pakistan is using ISI and ISA is using the militants to sponsor and to forward its own policy to ensure that people come in line, the countries that are in the neighborhood come in line and support Pakistan. Now in Sri Lanka, the Easter Sunday attack was an eye opener for them and the crackdown that was done came out with startling results. They were big businessmen who were involved and it was the same on the same pattern as what was happened what happened in uh, India in the Bombay blast when Dawood Ibrahim and his uh, family were involved in it. This shows that Pakistan has not given up its policy of using terrorism as its state policy and furthering its interests. As the world was still celebrating the fervor of New Year, India received a major setback in the form of Pulwama terror blast on February 14th. On that day, the beautiful land of Kashmir Valley was soaked with the blood of brave martyrs of Indian CRPF when a convoy of around 2,500 Central Reserve Police Force personnel was targeted by a Jaish e Mohammed suicide bomber, Adil Ahmed Dar. The attack on Indian security forces was the result of Pakistan's desperate pressure on the terrorists to indulge into action in Kashmir. Pulwama terrorist attack shares direct links with Pakistan's notorious spy agency, Inter Services Intelligence or ISI, because an extensive properly planned terror attack could not have been possible without a high-profile external support. 
Masood Azhar, the main conspirator of the Pulwama attack, has still not brought to justice, owing to ISI's support to these terror lords. Justice system all over the world requires evidence to convict anyone. Masood Azhar is the child and baby of ISI and the Pakistan army and they ensure that no evidence is presented against him whenever his case is called up in the court. It is for this reason that judges find it very difficult to give him a conviction. As many as 253 people died while hundreds got injured in a series of bomb blasts that hit luxury hotels and churches across Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday, leaving the entire country in a state of shock and lockdown. The attacks were claimed by the Islamic State, which is seeking to revive itself in South Asia after getting ousted from Iraq and Syria. It is pertinent to mention here that no terrorism group operates in a vacuum and each has some type of sponsor to help them stay funded and operational. In South Asia, Inter-Services Intelligence or Pakistan's ISI is the main organization that provides aids to the terror groups. The intensity of the Sri Lanka serial blast left the South Asian region aghast, which was already struggling to overcome the shock of Fulbama blast. This time the target was different, but again, the perpetrator was same, that is Pakistan. Pakistan and ISI's footprint on the Easter Sunday attacks is very clear. The ISI was the main perpetrator which organized the shifting of the arms, ammunition, stocking and piling of it, plus training these people who later on went up to put on the explosives in all the churches. The ISI footprint was again very visible the way after this attacks, these people who were involved in it were excavated, evacuated from Sri Lanka and brought to Pakistan. Afghanistan remained the hotbed of Pakistan-sponsored violence in 2019 too, as the country saw a series of terror blasts by the Taliban and Islamic State, the two prominent insurgent groups operating in the country. The wedding suicide bombing in Kabul by ISIS emerged as the deadliest terror attack in the country last year. A suicide bomber targeted an Afghan wedding, killing 92 people who belong to the country's minority Shiite Hazara community. The Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant group operating locally in as ISIS of Khorasan province claimed responsibility for the attack by issuing a statement on an IS-linked website. The group confirmed that a Pakistani Islamic State fighter targeted this large Shiite gathering in Kabul. It is pertinent to mention here that many countries in South Asia have seen an increase in terrorist activity from Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, Daesh and its affiliates in the past few years. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.